Visitors are treated to a walk and talk about the various plants that abound at this site and to learn how these resources were put to use by the tribe. The connection between plant life and the indigenous people is called ethnobotany. We are really lucky to be able to be here with this plant today and absolutely very important ethnobotanical plant um, in terms of food. Look at this, you guys. It's amazing. Look at this wapato. And you can almost just like feel them kind of like calling out to you. Everywhere that this plant is, it is a beloved food. Uh, do you know what parts people ate? The root. The root, yeah, um, mainly. But the, the leaves as they're emerging are also edible. And all parts of this plant are edible when, they're, when it's time. Uh, in the spring, there are no tubers, but there are fresh leaves. And they all have kind of like a, a culinary valuable flavor, but it's also a little bit what I would describe as swampy. They are exactly straight replacement for potato. Most of the time when I've harvested it, you wait until the water comes back, until the rains return. And so it's just starting to get cold. It's not the most comfortable activity to do in like early November. To harvest this plant, you have to dance in the muck, like up to your waist in water. And you do that, and then eventually, boop, 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 these purple tubers start floating to the surface. And that's how you harvest them. You just scoop them up off the surface of the water. Growing all over these grassy areas that we've been passing are one of the most prized uh, plant foods, especially in terms of starch and carbohydrates that people here would use. Can anyone guess what's here under the surface of the ground? Camus, Camus thank you. Uh, this is one of the plants that people in the Pacific Northwest did not farm. People were able to just like lift up this whole section of the soil and take the largest bulbs and set all the rest back down. And those ones have been aerated, all the, you know, they're not so root bound with their neighbors anymore because there's been spaces made in between them. And there's also been holes for baby seeds to, to fall. When we harvest camas, we take those bulbs, the biggest ones, and we peel them and we cook them really slow. They have um, <laughs> the same starch, if anyone's ever tasted a Jerusalem wait, artichoke. Wait, wait. It's a, a starch that is indigestible okay, as yeah, is, but if you cook it really low and slow, that starch uh, converts into simple sugars. And in the case of camas, traditional pit roasting can take like around 36 hours. Fully converted camas is like a sweet potato cooked for hours in brown sugar, only firmer. And you can just smash them a little bit flat and dry them in the sun and that there's food to go for a long time. Camas is hands down the most delicious wild food I've ever tasted. So there are camas uh, under here and they've probably just been, the seed, the delicate little dried out seed heads are, are brittle. Um, one thing to mention is that there's a look-alike. Does anyone know the name of the look-alike? Death camas. Yes, yeah, so there's a, another plant called death camas. They've reclassified it out of the lily family, Zygodinus. And it is, there's a lot of patterns that are different about Zygodinus, but the bulb looks, in my opinion, 100% identical. I really can't tell unless I taste it, and even then sometimes I think it would be tricky. So it's not uh, something for pure beginners to delve into. So come out with me sometime and I'll teach you how to harvest camas. One of the elements of this landscape are these magnificent trees. The Oregon white oak is the one oak that we have here. And so acorns offer an abundant food source uh, in this ecosystem. The acorns that the oak trees produce are very high in a chemical called tannin, which is a bitter, astringent chemical that if we ate the acorns straight, they would cause so much harm to the lining of our stomach that we would get really sick. Tannins are also used as medicine, and we know a lot about um, the benefits of tannins that are anti-cancer and especially for your colon and things like that. But in too high of levels, tannins are super irritating and drying of the tissues. So we have to leach them out. People here, as far as I know, would grind the acorns very fine with the same type of grinding stone that they have on display out there uh, at the plank house. And 
Um, the only way to get them fine enough is by using special baskets made of special plants um, that take a ton of skill to make. So there's this basket that sifts the acorn in a special way. And then you can use cold water that runs through the acorn meal and leaches the tannins out so then you can cook and eat the meal. Of all the foods, of all of the grains and nuts that exist, acorn is my favorite of either of those. Uh, it's very high in protein, depending on the species. Some are, I've heard, up to 30% protein. Very, many of them are very high in healthy fats. Wow, you're doing a great job there. The area also has a wide variety of mushrooms that can be used for various purposes. The chanterelle is especially good for cooking, and the Chinook incorporated them into their diet. Fall is the best time to gather them, so we set out into the coastal mountains with John Richardson to hunt for the delectable fungi. Now this is not anything we're really interested in. Okay. I'm only looking for a chanterelle, that's the only kind right. I know. So what's the best place to find these, Don? If you look, around and find the biggest, best looking, healthiest looking fir tree. Like this one next to right here. It doesn't right look real to healthy, but it looks <laughs> like it's been here a while. Yeah. <laughs> and that's where we found our candidates. But if you notice, this is Oregon grape here. Yeah. See the Oregon grape? Uh, they grow in the same area as the Oregon grape and Salal. Salal will grow right alongside Oregon grape. Right. So uh, here's a purple one. It's not a chanterelle, but real pretty. Who knows what it is? Something that looks like it's been eaten on. Yeah, really. Well, hey, whatever's been eating it didn't die, right? Uh, <laughs> or maybe it did. Not right, not immediately. <laughs> <laughs> one in there. And this. And that one. And this. This one is up. Woohoo! Oh, that's huge. Look how they push up. That's as big as your hand. Look how they push this. This is a very stick. Look at that stick. Look at the size of that. That's huge. Oh yeah. See how it, that stick was laying here and it's just coming up on both sides of it. And here we go. It won't fit in the hole. Here we go. First of, I think I got one right here. There we go. Sweet. There's a little bit of a rotten part we'll just cut yeah, out. We must take that off there. Oh man. Good job, John. There. What do you think? That's the find of the day? So far, All right. it rivals this other one for sure. Yeah. Man. Two of them right close to each other. Uh, now I've never seen one that big in a store. No. <laughs>